A viewer writes, I have been watching and enjoying your show, but with one complaint. Although I find many of your little stories quite interesting, I often feel at their conclusion that I fail to get the point. Could you perhaps specifically spell out the morals intended? Sincerely, <laughs> etc. Why, well, certainly, canker brain, you got it. And the viewer adds, well, no need to be nasty about it. Yeah, you're right, as always. But now on with the news. We open with a zoological update. Warthogs exist so that hyenas can have someone to laugh at. And presenters of the news exist so that, well, never mind that. Let's go on to something more important. One day, while sitting at home alone, just him, his body, and his mind, a man looked at the latter two and pondered, which one of you has given me the greater pleasure in life? My body, with all of its physical joys, or my mind, with its counterparts? He reflected on this for a while with no conclusive results, then finally picked up a book and headed for the bathroom. <laughs> Moral. A kingdom perceived to be divided amongst itself will generally find its greatest joys sitting down. <laughs> Man's mind has done many things to him, though not as many as he believes. On one world, the preeminent creatures, in an attempt to accelerate their progress by altering the prevailing situation, began to wear their trousers on their head while covering their privates with their hats. Until someone told them that the beings on earth did the same thing as a joke. <laughs> Moral. It's hard to know which way to turn if you're not actually going anywhere. Man's mind has shown him many things except the way out of itself. A man grabbed the microphone and announced and said, I have an important announcement to make. If you want to get ahead in life, complain. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, whine. And a guy in the crowd thought, though my aim may be different, I still like the approach. <laughs> One man had a pet lion and a pet parrot, two obviously quite different creatures, and yet. Over his years with them, he came to see that they were, in fact, not as different from one another as he, same as you, had originally believed. Moral, nothing is more domesticated a man than his own continuing flawed concepts. A certain man, upon hearing this story, contacted life and asked, Is saying that continuing flawed concepts are native to man an accusation or an objective notation? And if the latter is then the key word continuing, in that it is not his normal mental destiny for it ever to terminate. Moral. You cannot repair something that is not yet finished. The minimal evidence of one's normalcy is in believing that man the collective should be better. And the ultimate proof thereof is in the failure to act thereon individually. Rather than wasting any more time reading, one man established in his own head the Idiot of the Month Club, <laughs> which he later revised to better reflect the reality of the situation to Idiot of the Moment. <laughs> Preview of coming attractions. Those who understand more never criticize any but themselves, and then only in private. Least it become a discussion and thus squander its usefulness. The reason that the brain cannot comprehend what it would be like if its presently unused areas were operational is because this can only be comprehended by the new presently unused areas of the brain. Neat, huh? After doing one of the local gods a favor, the deity in return offered to tell the man the secret. Though admitting he couldn't do so directly, he told the man that the secret could be spelled out using the letters M-O-R. 
T R O W M and O. And after punning this for the man for a moment, the man spat back, Hell, all that does is spell tomorrow. And the divine one pouted, Well, it could spell something else. <laughs> Moral. At the normal level, enlightenment depends on how dumb you are. <laughs> the reason men so adore their nighttime dreams is the, is the same basis on which military men admire a well-executed, close-order drill. As one civilization was hoisted up by its nipples, it exclaimed, I am not a parade, I am man which certainly gave the hoisting mechanism a good laugh. <laughs> How to test for your own simplicity. Just ask yourself these three questions. One, do you believe that your internal states are affected and directed by external events? Two, do you take the thoughts that pass through your mind to be your own? And three, do you think that was only two questions? <laughs> Keep in mind that in spite of such inquiries, an alligator's potential understanding of reptilian reality is severely limited. Read minimal. In fact, read crocodilianly so. Moral. What's the use in telling people about the wondrous mountain kingdom of Shangri-La when all they're interested in is a continuing remapping of the valleys and gulches? Note, the Federal Trade Off Commission has issued a bulletin <laughs> confirming your suspicion of how little interest there is in tests for people's simplicity. <laughs> in normal mental conflict, it is only the conflict itself that is of any value, not a conclusive outcome or victory. Hard to remember, huh? <laughs> oh, the man moaned. I am so beset by transversity. Oh, the transversity. And someone asked, do you mean adversity? And he replied, yes, but mine moves about. Oh. <laughs> Moral. Progress, in quotation marks, amongst the ordinary can be tricky to measure. On one planet, some of the beings had a tape recorder in their head. And others, a word processor. Still others, a camera. Boy, are there some weird worlds out there or what? <laughs> when one man heard a health warning concerning addictions that said, if you think you might have a problem with alcohol, you probably do. He thought, shame's the same's not so regarding stupidity. <laughs> One of the unheralded singularities of the secret is that it is the only thing hidden from man, the discovery of which is not aided by looking for it. No, it is not true that life has a perverse sense of humor. What's happening is that the mind normally only sees, at best, three-fifths of, what of what's actually occurring, which limited view tends to produce in men feelings of them having been assaulted by irony, mockery, and tra travesty. Moral. Where does a blind man playing blind man's bluff get off being pissed when he loses? Again. There is nothing you can do with the subcortical realm of yourself other than assist the body in being as healthy as it can be. Above that level, there's nothing you can actually do other than attempt this kind of stuff. Narrows down the focus of life. Huh. The danger of spitting in the wind when you don't know what you're doing is that you are the wind. And could they comprehend this, many a man would say, ah, so that's why it's so sloppy and painful. The supreme diagnosis for every normal person. The operations of your mind seem perfectly fine, as long as you aren't paying any attention to them. Curious, huh? One legend says that after Adam finally realized what being thrown out of the garden actually represented in his life, 
he immediately became this planet's first would-be mystic. But God quickly caught on to what he was about to attempt and to counteract it, offered Adam a weird-looking robe and hat to play with, <laughs> which successfully distracted him. Moral, aren't you, his children, ashamed of yourselves? Well, I guess not. <clears throat> One reason that men are satisfied to live at their natural level of awareness is that it protects them from having to write their own material. <laughs> Definition time. Collective consciousness. The ultimate ghost writer. I beg your pardon, but shouldn't that be life you're referring to? Well, yes, but I had no idea I was talking to anyone who actually understood anything. My apologies, sir. You certainly got to be well behaved to get on the train, but being well behaved once you're on won't get you anywhere. Moral. It's only tough titty if you don't realize that it's tough titty. Note, the reason men so enjoy stories with a moral is because it gives the illusion of finality. Oh yeah, that viewer who contacted us at the beginning of the show has done so again to say, okay, I give. Enough already with the morals. One way to tell that someone who claims to know the secret does not is that they are secretive and serious about it. Or else they're delighted to tell you about it for $1.98, which includes an autographed picture of themselves. If the true problem, as men want to call it, is simply his state of mental consciousness, then consider this. The simple of the world call it sin. The more sophisticated refer to it in terms of psychological difficulties, while the overall more civilized of the planet think of it in the context of the need for the continuing cultivation of humanity. Now, for everyday purposes, this sufficiently covers it, but for anyone still with me on this, it does not. All of the above noted notations are too operationally vague and too uncertain in their aim to be of any practical use to those with a more active grasp of what it is that is at the base of this perceived indigenous mortal problem. Moral, a man who realizes that he suffers from a beast thing will not accept a body cast as proper treatment. <laughs> Once upon a time, a man wrote to life and asked, Dear life, just what is a problem? And life replied, You're talking to him. <laughs> <clears throat> Many have been the number who rode off on the great mystical quest, but only the few never returned. And a boy asked his father, But, yeah, I know, said the old man, you don't get it. Da 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 da. <laughs> Examining himself in an unusual mirror, a man so reflected. If the heart stops pumping, a man stops living. And if the lungs quit inhaling, a man quits living. And if the kidneys cease to function, a man ceases living. But if the mind stops a minding, what happens then? And the mirror cracked. There was, there was a man whose ability to pay his phone bill finally ran out. Actually, his ability to pay didn't run out. His inclination to do so did. <laughs> and one night, Buddha and a bunch of the guys were sitting quietly around the campfire, staring into the flames. When one of them suddenly turned to Buddha and says, Oh, I'm sorry, what would you say? And Buddha replied, I didn't say anything. If you recall, one time recently we were speaking of uh, the mental operations of the mind, the mental operations of man being constructed of no more than a non-ending sensation of conflict. That as I tried to describe the six billion sane people of this planet, if we could take an aerial view and they're all standing on a flat on a level surface, 
that above their head, if we saw the top of their heads metaphorically representing the extent of the physical instinctive life of man, then everyone's out there at the same level. Things going as they should, and no real question. There should not be any uncertainty as to what's going on at that level. It's just stay alive. But then going above the heads of men, which would represent above the level of consciousness in the brain, in the human nervous system, but going above the, to make it a three-dimensional external picturization, above the heads of men would be all of these lines, these like spider webs, these filaments coming out of each person's brain and then meeting, joining, bumping into numerous others, in theory, six billion others around them. And then all of this coming together and turning into strange kinds of configurations. But that becomes, that is the civilized mental world of man. And what holds it up is the pressure of the conflict. Now people look at a brighter day of humanity. The simple, of course, want to look at it as that a better day, a better future would be an improvement in their physical condition, such as, as I mentioned, winning large sums of money, being in better health, being better looking, uh, having a better car. But if you get just a little bit above that, and people who believe, who feel that way in general, does not deny them ephemeral moments of ex their view extending as to what would be a better day, but the in general better day for those a bit more cultivated, a bit more complex at the ordinary level, is that would be an end not to just mortal, not to just physical conflict, which would be the more simplistic level, would be a cessation of mental conflict. Although they may say it uh, in terms of a day coming when men do not rise up in anger over disputes over religious beliefs or over cultural norms or over uh, varying senses of morality. But taken at, a, at the basic level, which is not disingenuous to look at this way, is you can see that there are really only two forms of conflict available, and that is out and out physical conflict and the non-physical. So those representing a level of a bit more complexity within the mainstream of life, they see a better future of man as being an end in non-physical conflict. You do understand that already takes as a done deed when they dream of it, that the day has already passed when men are engaged in a, are driven and held by physical conflict. They're already dreaming somewhat of a more civilized day, which is in isolated pockets at isolated times, uh, is extant already in the life of men, but that the more civilized people, if we take it just an end a fairly, a more localized level, in areas on the planet where people are right now, just as a rule, they are just naturally, they are mechanically more civilized, then their fears, the greatest threats to them are not physical conflict, at least amongst themselves, if they stay with their own, if they stay with those at their own level of mechanical development. Then their fear is not that their next door neighbor who is a banker, an attorney, or physicist, or educator, they don't fear that they're going to get beat up physically in the neighborhood. What they fear is, what they see as being, is representing a better day of man is when non-physical conflict comes to an end. Do note that this never occurs, or those of you that are getting good, it does occur, but when it occurs, the conflict disappears. No one takes note of it. They don't realize that the Conflict itself was the only thing that had any value. It was the only thing propping up the conflict was the conflict. No, you didn't mishear it. Okay. Now, I gave it to you the easy way in the news item tonight that mental conflict is only a value, or the only value of it, any mental conflict is in the conflict itself, not in any conclusive victory one side or the other. It's not a choice that men make 
people of conflicting political views, people of conflicting religious beliefs, and anything else you can come up with. They do not choose to come into conflict. And those staying on the sidelines, attempting to observe from a more detached or from those who may not be involved with any particular conflict, let us say. There's someone seeing a conflict uh, between uh, religion X and religion Y, and someone who is of n neither persuasion, they look upon it as being moot. They will, in fact, attempt to offer objective, reasonable, dispassionate counseling. They will attempt to act as mediator. Whether invited or not, they will at least offer a theoretical verbal survey of the scene and point out to both parties that you people are making a mistake. You have more in common than you believe. It's getting nowhere. What's the point of arguing over something that is not life-threatening? No. And it all seems reasonable. It's been going on throughout the known history of man that there are notations being made from third parties not involved with any particular conflict. Remember, we're speaking about a non-physical conflict of people trying to point out the futility of it, uh, the foolishness of it. It's just ridiculous, and it's not ridiculous. The people involved are not fools. The people involved are not misled. The people involved are not engaged in a futile act. Now, from any, if it helps get it started, the kind of non-involved observer that I mentioned that there are traces of, it's not unknown, that tries to point out. It goes on even today. It's nothing old and it's not that obscure if I'm making it sound that way. Uh, today in political conflicts, if it makes it any easier for something simple, right? Today, you can have two nations warring over some whatever the... Whatever the purpose, they're in a conflict, and some third party that doesn't seem to be particularly aligned with either one will offer to mediate, to try and bring them to the peace table so they can sit down and try to find some common ground to at least stop the slaughter, for, stop harming civilians and helpless children. Throughout history, there have been people, uh, it's not given as much notice, and that's not given any particular notice historically, but there's been other times it's not unknown that someone in an intellectual, a non-physical conflict, uh, plays out a part of a non-participant. And they try to point out that you people are engaged in a meaningless conflict. And uh, in fact, the, the more you pursue this conflict, uh, the greater the danger is it can go from the non-physical world into a physical realm. The only reason I point this out, again, it is not absolutely unknown, if people could see it that way, to ordinary minds, that there is always a third possible view of every conflict, except it does not fit into the dance. It is like a, somebody's up doing a nice ballroom dance or a tango, and it's like some guy shows up dressed in a uh, football uniform, and he tries to, as they're dancing, he seems to in some way try to get involved with this tangle they're doing, this choreographed dance that they seem to be doing quite well, and the guy dressed up as a football player seems to walk out on the floor and he tries to engage them in some sort of sermon he has to deliver about the dangers of a uh, too little roughage in your diet. Either that or the <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous enough. <laughs> Other than the fact you understand taking in isolation, none of this is ridiculous. If you just take two people dancing or a guy in a football uniform, someone <laughs> pointing out the dangers of a lack of roughage in the diet, none of it's funny, none of it's silly until you stick it together. <laughs> For those of you that still ponder why are some things funny and why are some things not, and why do you find some things funny when you, if you ever think about it, realize that hardly anyone else in the world would. <laughs> <clears throat> The disinterested party, what I was saying is it's never giving a particular note because it's, and this has to do with the nature of the mind. It's just another possibility of you getting a different glimpse of it is that two parties involved with the struggle, which I was representing as two people on a dance floor. Uh, perhaps even better, if anyone still 
pictures that are not the what used to be called the or is called the Apache dance, which is actually better than tango. It was this choreographed little scene that I think was indigenous to the French cabaret scene. Uh, the Apache dance was that the man and woman is very highly choreographed and stylized, but it apparently is going through a lover spat. And the man throws a woman around and grabs her by her hair. She slaps him, kicks him with her high heels. And it comes to some sort of, at any rate, that's the basis of the dance. Forget the finale. The finale of all dances, you have to bow and tell the audience, the good guys won. <laughs> so we all know that. But at any rate, the heart of the dance was that it apparently was a conflict, but was stylized. It was non injurious to anyone's well being on the dance floor. But there it was, and it takes a great deal of practice, and they choreographed practice for them to be able to slap themselves, you know, apparently him slap her around and her kick him in what can be a very sensitive spots on males. And he grabs her by her hair, the good ones, and could actually swing her around and so by her arms and legs as dancers used to do. But at any rate, it took, the point being, it takes a great deal of practice for that to go on. And then I was trying to say that, you're supposed to understand, represents metaphorically these kinds of non-injurious, that is non-physical mental conflicts in which men are continually engaged and these periodic outside observers which represents a third possibility. By the way, there's a story I never told. There used to be this kingdom that had two opposing armies and they were always at each other's throat. And what they didn't know was that there was another army hanging around. But here it is, these people are doing the Apache dance. And I was trying to represent, here comes a guy dressed up, perhaps I picked the wrong sport, dressed up in a full baseball catcher's regalia. The mask and the pad. And, the, and he shows up there on the dance floor while they're doing this, and he keeps trying to engage them. Maybe I shouldn't even have been specific enough as to the dangers of a low roughage diet. I started to do something about higher mathematics. But the point is, the whole thing is supposed to be, what struck you that you put it together was, to say the least, incongruous. That is why it's not noticed. That's why it's not noticed in a man's own mind. Ordinary men continually have the opportunity. Just like that, but they have the opportunity. They're sitting there hearing about some conflict between, let's say, two uh, religious beliefs. And the man has no particular interest in either one. And it's not that people necessarily become specifically conscious momentarily enough to realize what life's about but put to you another way they have it's like a possible door opens in the mind it's like a split second between neural firings that are of a specific known nature to him a comfortable nature and it's like a man sitting there let's say just watching tv and it's something about the continuing conflict between the shiite muslims and the shini muslim and he's going and he he goes, if I hear this anymore, what the hell's wrong with these people? And he's got no interest either way, but something strikes him momentarily before he went, what the hell's going on? It's like almost a moment, almost an opportunity of him realizing that it doesn't mean anything. It almost has to be with ordinary people, even sane, sophisticated people. It almost has to be something in the world of events that as far as they can ascertain, well, as far as it seems to be, has real no personal connection to them, then it really does no good. It accomplishes nothing. But all I'm saying is men have the opportunity of being dressed in a full baseball catcher's regalia and walking out suddenly on a dance floor where two people are engaged in this very stylized dance, and he realizes the incongruity of it all Okay. <laughs> the notice that there is always a third possibility goes unnoticed. What it would do, let me put it to you another way. One reason it goes unnoticed is that it is outside the conflict. Not just technically outside the conflict in that a man, the fictitious man I was describing may have no interest in the apparent basis of the conflict that he's observing, but that a third possibility is always outside the realm of a conflict. That's why those two armies don't know about the third one. And it's always there. 
If you, catch, if you could catch a man's mind right at that moment when I said that there is a continuing possibility that someone could see the futility, someone could see the illusion, none of these words fit, of the conflict. A better would be the speciousness of the conflict, which is no way of saying it's an illusion, but necessarily an illusion. But the reason that they cannot even see it, the reason they cannot exercise, that they cannot make use of the possibility of seeing a third possibility in all conflicts is, is should they see it, then what they were looking at disappears. It is not natural. It is physically not natural for the brain to operate in that way. How about that? And then, of course, if you're as worn out as listening to that as I was talking about, you can go, well, all right, I'll accept it. Jesus. Good. You know, I'll, I'll go with that. Press on. Thank you. Thank you. Good. There's an extreme, dangerous ways for a few people to deal in mental conflict. It is the basis of all the more simplistic versions that come out through religions and human and most humanistic philosophy, but especially religion, of the condemnation continually of one man criticizing another. Leave it up to God. Men are not, you shouldn't do that. God said not to, Allah said not to, Buddha said don't do it. And there seems to be some uh, extra systemic source for this. The man attempt to validate the dictum that you should not criticize your fellow man. They attempt to validate it as coming from some supernatural source. Because they don't know how to explain it. It's just one of those things. But it can be explained. At the ordinary level, you should note, none of men's injunctions, even those that they take to be of supreme, even supernatural importance, are not all that important. And they know it. Well, <laughs> men say, God says so and so. And they repeat it over and over, and they don't do it. And you go, well, how important? Or they can't do this even, but you should, an outside observer, could say, well, wait a minute. You're saying that the... The strongest force in the universe. You're saying God. Whatever you think that means. Yes, God's it. And you're saying that God says, don't do this. Right. All right. Have you stopped doing it? Oh, no. Would you do it a lot? Yes. Well, as soon as you heard that you shouldn't do it, were you aware of the fact that as soon as you heard that you did? Oh, immediately. Do you do it any less? Well, I can't say I do. You continue to do it. Yes. And you're still sure that God said, don't do that. Yes, I'm sure. Now, if you just walked away and you had the ability to think outside the Apache dance, a man could ask himself, well, how important is this that these people are convinced that God said, don't, do not do that, and they continue to do it? I mean, why is the God looks down and goes, oh, what the hell? <laughs> you realize I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about the efficacy of man's mor moral convictions. I'm talking about that it's meaningless. And since men know that this structure is meaningless in one sense, this is not what caused it, but in one sense, that is why. One of the reasons they came up with the idea of supernatural forces and the idea of God. Because they know this whole thing is meaningless. And all their criticism one to another, all this conflict, they know is meaningless. And to give it some sense of meaningless, since it now, the more civilized you are, it takes up a greater and greater part of your life. And to have the, let us say, subtle suspicion that it's all bullshit at least you need something to kind of reinforce it like wait a minute this can't be just bullshit because look over here a guy told me that God said we should be engaged in this and many people as soon as they hear it they never even thought about it before they think I like that <laughs> and I like to I can go with that I like the premise you know what the hell and they run off with it because it seems it's like God said some force much more intelligent than we are said that this is important Hey, who am I to say otherwise? And most people they can coast along with that more or less. It is unnatural for the mind. It's impossible at the ordinary level also for the mind to see that there is always a third possibility to see that the conflict is not meant to be resolved. In a three-dimensional world, to use the general description or even a four-dimensional a conflict is not to be resolved because it disappears. 
It absolutely it is. Rain falling back to the earth, it's absorbed, and you never see it again. Oh, you see it again, but you don't recognize it. You think, oh my God, it's raining today. It's not raining today. It's not raining today's rain. What the hell do you call that? It's not today's rain you're seeing. Oh, but yeah, but you should have been here two weeks ago. It poured. Yeah, I know. The overall historical dictum of you should not criticize yourself. Now, everybody knows that. It's indicative. In every religion, most ordinary civilized men, whether they be religious or not, will repeat, will insist upon the propriety that we should not, at least in an offhand, uncontrolled manner, be criticizing our fellow man. Who are we to say? No one can deal with it. It ultimately makes no more sense than anything else, and they have to rely usually upon some extra systemic, either supernatural force in the sense of a deity, or else if they're not religiously inclined to say that it is simply a standard to which man should aspire, but we have yet to reach such a point as being able to execute it. Those who know how can execute as well now as they could 3,000 years ago or as well as they can two weeks from now when it will pour. <laughs> Criticism. Put to you the easy way if it was just you and I speaking. Criticism is a great danger to someone attempting to do anything at all with their own consciousness because the criticism of a thing, no matter what it is, is as bad as the thing you're be that's being criticized. Now, having said that, as always, you need to note that the ordinary level, that's bullshit. Because the ordinary level, it has no meaning to ordinary people criticizing one another. That's why they keep repeating, hey, you shouldn't criticize your fellow man. That's no reason that they keep hectoring one another. That's no reason that, that a man is subject to being hectored thereby. The man going, well, look at those damn people. All right. And someone goes, the beam in one's eye and the moat. And say, yeah. the guy goes, oh, you're right. You're right. I, I know better. I know better. You know, who am I to judge? After the fact. People say it's not possible. And they attribute it, as I said, that it has some supernatural origins, which precludes it becoming part of a mortal's arsenal. Or they just say it's somewhere, it's some level of civility to which ordinary men have yet to reach. And it's not true. It has to do with a certain operation of the intellect. A certain kind, a, another version of consciousness. If what a man's consciousness amounts to is simply the operations of his mind as he was, as with which he was born, which, of course, is everyone's natural state of, quote, consciousness. It is simply a manifestation of the mind. Whatever it is going through your mind, that's your level of consciousness, and it has nothing to do with the specific content. It's just that if your consciousness is your mind in operation, then you're at the same level as everyone else, and at that level, to criticize another person Is itself meaningless. It just helps spur on the dance. It helps fuel the general dance and parade of human <coughs> evolution. <coughs> <coughs> progress, progress, pro <coughs> pardon, progress, pro progress, progress. But when I said just between you and I that if we were speaking that, that there is validity to say that it is a, it is a real danger. It is, you're bleeding to criticize other people. And yet that is not objective. It is not true with everyone. It has no objective reality because ordinary people criticizing one another is not doing them any harm. It's why they have to keep repeating it is because it is an echo of the future, but it is not doing an ordinary man any harm. The whole idea of the uh, 
biblical injunctive uh, about that you should not be criticizing the uh, might in your neighbor's eye until you pick out the beam in your eye. And everyone, any civilized person under the right condition will go, yeah, you're right, Jesus. You know, who am I? I mean, it's, it's, you know, shit is this person may be acting. <laughs> God, some of the things I've done. <laughs> it's all that. You know, it's some excuse for not being able to comprehend what you're doing or for some reason not being able to execute what you agree should be one of the guiding principles of a man's life, that is, do not criticize. And so men claim that it has significance, that it has potential significance, that God may get you for it later, or that in fact uh, some will even opine that it could have an adverse effect on you now, that karma may not be a post-death reality, that criticizing people now could you know, have some kind of psychological harm to you. I don't know, it could come back to haunt you or something. At the ordinary level, it's not going to haunt anybody. It's not hurting them. You understand? Because everyone criticizes. That is part of this structure. There's nothing to criticize up there. Remember, we're talking about non-physical. We're not talking about someone cutting the throats of babies. We're not talking about actual physical conflict. We're talking about up in this world, wherein everything other than physical conflict is held together by the pressures of opposition. At that level, for ordinary people, to, for, for a Jew to criticize a Muslim, I mean, he might as well be criticizing uh, the fact that General Motors quit making fins on cars. <laughs> it has the same validity. Or I put it another way, it will do him or her the same damage for a person to go, I probably shouldn't do this. Some Hindu go, but those goddamn Buddhists drive me crazy. I, I mean, they're just, they're idiots. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that. That has the same significance, the same importance on that man's soul, his well-being, his essence, his mind. It has the same significance on this planet as that man going, I know I shouldn't say this, but I can't stand Chinese food. I mean, I don't know what it is. In other words, it has none. It's only, it's only when you get to the background of the reality of such things as conventional wisdom, religious notions, as you get into the actual electrochemical area, there's the background for all this, right here in the human brain, the individual brain, that there is some danger. That you are not just wasting your time, if you're attempting to do something with your own consciousness, you're not wasting your time, you're bleeding. You're not wasting energy in the sense that, well, you shouldn't be criticizing your fellow man for this or that moral reason. Of course, me saying this is not going to stop you. You got to see it for yourself. But criticizing someone else, non-physical behavior in other humans, and that could be extended, but Jesus, give you a break. All right, so we'll leave it at non-physical. To criticize other people is you are bleeding yourself. And even the crudest of civilized people some time ago, in case you hadn't noticed, gave up somewhere around the turn of the century going to barbers and letting them cut them to be treated for cancers, and tumors and various nervous disorders. <laughs> At any rate, you're, you're bleeding yourself because you're doing no harm to anyone else. You're way past, or you should be way past any fear about that. But what you have done, if we were taking it in the moralistic sense, let's do that so it seems to have some weight to it. Well, it seems to have some flesh and bones is what I meant. If you criticize someone else's uh, ideas, their morals, but their ideas like their religious beliefs or their, their claims as to what is the nature of reality and et cetera, and you hear it and you go, well, God damn, they're idiots. See, when you do that, now remember this is the crude version, but I was trying to give you something to hang this invisible clothes on. When you do that, I'm going to say it fast so we can get off of it because this is not it. When you do that, what you have done is drag whatever you understood to start with, whatever the depths of stupidity or degradation, degradation that you think that they, in which they're operating, you are immediately, it's got nothing to do with morality, but you are immediately at that level to criticize it. You have lowered 
your brain activity, you have lowered a kind of potential enriched blood to the brain. You have lowered, you have lessened the electrochemical activity of the brain. Is anyone following this? Let's assume what you're criticizing in other people, an ordinary mind would call it, well, their low morals or their stupidity. What you're criticizing without knowing it is their lower than potential level of intellectual operation of their brain. You're, what you're saying is their brain is not operating at the efficiency at which it could, or else I couldn't criticize it. Okay? But as soon as you did that, your brain went to that level. And if you told ordinary people that, and if they listen to this, they go, oh, well, you, I know what you're doing now. You're metaphorically referring to the fact that who are we to judge? I just said that wasn't it. And that's why I said, don't listen to that. Your brain will slow down to that level. Uh, all right, here's why that's so hard to hear. I already set you up for the night whether you heard it. There was a news item that said the difficulty in the mind, the brain, comprehending what it would be like to be more conscious, or another way to put it, for the brain to comprehend what it would be like for presently unused areas of itself to be functional. Why it's so difficult for it to realize it, to have any notion of it, is because it would take these new unused areas of the brain to understand what it would be like. And many people went, oh, now I understand it. I, we, I don't need that kind of sarcasm. <laughs> but what else are you going to do? When you get desperate and someone's nailed your brain to the wall and you participate, all you can do is go, well, <laughs> nah, I know, I know. As long as, as long as you know where to direct it and don't get it on me or anyone else. As long as you know where to direct it to go, ah, oh, rats. <sighs> well, let's assume, or I will go ahead and assume that you have some understanding of the absolute, just a few people, you, you either know it or you don't, danger in criticizing other people. That's not, well, I shouldn't do that because. If you still have to operate on whatever you do, that I shouldn't do that because. There's no because. If you're still dealing with a because, because God, because my mother, because society, well, because it's the right thing, then you, got, you don't know what you're doing. There is no because. But assume that you do have your own understanding. I'll go ahead and speak theoretically. Press on. That it is a danger. This is a personal, individual danger. Nobody's business. It is not a danger outside of you. It is not a cosmic danger. It is not a moral danger. It is not a spiritual danger. But there is a danger to those attempting to ride this train to criticize anyone else. And I say danger. It is it's bloodletting. It's worse than sitting there on the train, even though you were once on it and staring out the window, which you're going to spend 90% of your time, no matter if you ever get somewhere close to Istanbul. You end up spending 90% of your time staring out the window. And go, oh, that's bad enough. But to criticize other people, you're not only staring, you're cutting yourself. It is just, as I said, remember, uh, when I say it's just terrible and all that, it's not you got to bring it upon yourself because if you don't realize it's terrible, I, believe me, it's not. I mean, I, I give you that free. Of course, it wouldn't do any good, but I was going to say if we had just ordinary, civilized, religious, guilt-ridden people listening, then I'll at least throw you that free. It's not doing you a damn bit of harm. Which, of course, won't do them any good because if it do them any good, they wouldn't be ordinary, guilt-ridden, religious people. So there you go. Where? Well, <clears throat> talking to I don't want to think about many people. But let's assume that I'm speaking, referring theoretically to a person who understands that it is an absolute, personal, private, but real, immediate danger. It is a stumbling block. It is a bloodletting process for me to entertain. My mind will do it. To immediately I hear somebody make an idiotic remark and go, well, you idiot. I mean, hell. Quit listening to that and listen to the noise of your liver. It has as much intelligence, it has as much insight as your mind going, well, those idiots. 
this is very difficult. Well, I'm getting, I know too obscure, but for those of you who are interested in such matters, your liver actually has a better sense of morality <laughs> than your brain. But I don't, we're too late to go into that. But to show you, I'll give you some hint about the validity of that, notice this. In no religious literature, even the, the obscurities in any religious literature, there is not one mention in any religious literature of the importance of the liver. Think about it. But we'll assume <clears throat> that my fictitious person, that you understand that there is an absolute danger of criticizing anything, non-physical non aspects of human life. That, they, that every time you do, you literally, not figuratively, not metaphorically, that you literally have slowed down your brain operations, or you have literally brought your level of consciousness at the exact level of what you are criticizing. There's no ifs, there's no maybes, there's no technical ways out. <laughs> you just, it just is a fact. And you'll find, if you pursue this, you'll, it'll just strike you one day. You know it just as well as the fact that, whew, boy, I'd... That last bottle of wine was too much. You'll be as convinced, you'll be as act as certain then as your liver is, does. But let's assume that you're past that point, that you do comprehend that. Then, whether you can do it all the time or not, to give you a way out again, but that you do understand that all criticism, I hate to say ill-founded because it sounds like a baby that just made doo-doo in his pants. <laughs> It makes your tongue feel like it has a hairy palm. But once you understand that all criticism is just, you know, is it, you're hurt, it's you. You have hurt yourself. Assume that you are already, under, that you understand that personally. Then, then what you've got is this. What? This. Oh. I thought I missed it. Oh, I think you did. What you have then is this. Okay, I'll repeat it. Could you do it slower this time? <laughs> Well how, well, how about this one? Instead of just blabbering it out, since I have some hesitation about doing this over the airway, someone suggested, well, why don't you say it a bit lower? Okay. Here's how it go. It's an old joke. Uh, the punchline does not fit the original setup. But assuming that you understand that there is... That it's an absolute waste of time and a danger and a bloodletting to criticize any, anything else going on. That you're interfering, that you are in, engaged in the mental conflict with other people. Is then to turn it all in here. Because you can do the other. People reach that point. That is not something that's just speculative. Many people that get involved, they can reach that point that they do have their own understanding. Forget whether they can go the rest of their life and never get caught up in something happening. Their mind goes, well, that, look at them crazy bastards, and you just ride along with it. It's not either. Anyway, there are people who understand that as much as humanly possible under the conditions of themselves at the time. But then the tricky one is yourself, because your own mind will not operate without its own internal structure of ideas pushing against themselves. And you can tell the mind that. Let me assume, since I've got to, the tape's running out, that you've got the part about the absolute futility at best and the danger at worst of dealing with external conflicts, of you arguing with other people's ideas and criticizing them, of pushing against them, going, oh, you idiot, whatever it is. That let's assume you understand that. And then if I say right quick, well, hey, you can do that. That's possible. But the real level where it becomes distinctively operational, where it can change you, as you realize that I do that internally. And I'm not talking about my little jokes about a guy uh, insulting his mind and his mind insulting him. Not that. It's just what passes for thought where you ordinarily has that same internal structure that above your own brain. It's as though there's this invisible structure and people take that normally to be themselves, but at least you take it as your mind. And we're not talking about thoughts that you have of which you find or with which you find fault. It's all of them. And you tell the mind, all of them. And the mind goes, all of them? And you go, all of them. And it goes, all of them? <laughs> Don't stand there. Where? There. Where? There. What are you going to do? 
But what? That, what? <laughs> if you partake of the conflict, if you entertain the conflict, as long as you accept, assuming you understand what I mean by conflict, of ideas in your brain, in your mind, not out there, or some of you are past that, or at least you understand it, that it's a fact. But in here, there is where the trick is. Or to put it to you another way, and I'm not being insulting to anybody. I know, absolutely, that's almost impossible to do. Look at me doing my best. It can't even be described. Now I have to fall into things like, well, don't stand there. Where? There? Where? There? Everything? Yes, everything. It can't be everything. Yes, it's everything. It just it ends up making no sense because you have reached the limits of the mind, which is no big deal, by the way. <laughs> I always like that about people who think they're interested in such as this, and they worry about, what well, can I live long enough? You know, well, you know, if you have to ask, probably not. Well, what if I take up this great mystical struggle, this great quest, and I, and I tire? You know, I don't know what to tell you, except, you know, maybe get a recap or, you know, get plugged. Or... <laughs> but you tell the mind that the support of the internal, that your own normal processes are an unrealized support of meaningless conflict. That's the only way you think. And I was going to say, put to you another way to even, I know this is just as bad, but that is another description of, turn around just what I said, if you can follow it. Another description would be right at the spitting edge of another state of consciousness. Because what that, what it's pointing to is that what normally passes as thought now would cease. And one guy inside went, God, it got quiet in here. Were the sounds of battle. Oh, there they are. <laughs> it scared me for a minute. I thought I was going crazy. 